Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. My name is James White. We've got a lot to get to today. I, I remember uh, when the, um, the tsunami hit Japan a number of years ago, the big earthquake, and then the tsunami hit. That was the first time I heard about a world event faster on Twitter than I heard about it on television. And today we have this massive explosion in Beirut. And now everybody and their third cousin is uh, posting stuff on social media. And what's interesting is there was the initial explosion. And so everybody starts videotaping. And so the huge, what seems to me to be multi kiloton explosion um, that happened afterwards and, and evidently has broken every pane of glass for 50 miles. Uh, I saw one taken inside a car and ev the windshield, side windows, everything shattered instantly by this thing. It's huge. Um, the numbers of deaths I've seen have been relatively small. I have a feeling that's gonna change a lot unfortunately, over uh, the course of time. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, that, that, was, that was astonishing. And um, the pictures coming out of, the, of the, the port area now, wow, that just, it looks like nuclear weapon really, really did. So Pray for uh, believers in that area. Uh, pray that uh, the Lord would uh, would help and guide even the small churches that are in places like that and uh, give them grace and strength at this particular uh, point in time. An amazing, uh, amazing thing that's taking place today. Um, this morning, a friend of mine sent me some quotations. I had seen the article pop up on my feed and hadn't had the time to get to it. A lot of people are going to be getting to it, I'm afraid, uh, over the next couple of days. And, and I'm not sure why I said I'm afraid. I mean, it, it's, it's appropriate and properly so. But um, if you, many people struggle with the idea that men from whom you have learned much in the past, men, from whose ministry you have benefited are today speaking in a way where we, we now can really sense that there has been a no longer subtle transformation of their vocabulary and their emphasis. Those who have become woke, who have embraced the categories of critical theory, uh, power dynamics, and are now speaking into the same channels of teaching that they used 15 years ago to speak of the gospel and biblical teachings and Christian doctrine are now using those same avenues to connect biblical teaching and the gospel to things they never did only a few years before. If your favorite Bible teacher, and, and don't, don't go on emotion and feeling, check the actual emphasis, check, the, check what they're really, really saying. Um, if your favorite Bible teacher today is saying very different things than they did 10 to 15 years ago, there might be a reason for it. There might be a reason for it. And what's happening is you're, you're getting a completely different lens placed over the Bible. So the Bible is being read differently. We're, we're, we're being told that everyone has an, irremovable lens provided by their culture. And you see, the problem is there's, there's always an element of truth. In every lie, there's an element of truth. 
there is no question, no question at all that you can provide hours and hours of examples of where Americans read the text of scripture as if it is speaking to us in our day only. We do it in eschatology. We've done it in eschatology for a long, long time. Uh, American Christians will assume that everything that the Bible says is about us. Americans assume pretty much everything is about us. I didn't really notice that until I started traveling overseas, and then I was embarrassed by how much that is the case. But it is the very essence of the clips that are posted by the IFB preacher Twitter feed that you can provide hours of examples of people reading the Bible as if it were written last year, primarily directed to Americans in the early 21st part, in the early part of the 21st century. There's no question about that. But obviously, if you did serious exegesis, that would immediately challenge so much of that if you were if you were first and foremost uh, concerned about the meaning that the author intended in writing to the audience that he was writing to in the language he was writing to in the day that he was writing to if you do the hard work of consistently asking the tough questions of the text you can filter a lot of that out but even in application, you're going to be dealing with that particular issue as well. You're all, we do have lenses. There's no question about that. But you see, that's something completely different than saying there is no objective meaning of Scripture. There's no way of knowing the objective meaning of Scripture. We've got to give up on that. We have to listen to all these different voices. And if you listen to the voices over here, then that's going to make you better than if you listen to the voices over there. And and so on and so forth. That, that's, that's a completely different thing. And that's where the confusion is coming in. And so as you listen to people who you once found clear and compelling, and obviously if you're gonna come to the conclusion that someone's changed, you always have to raise the question, have they changed or have I changed? And if you can honestly analyze yourself and go, no, I've, I've resisted the cultural trends to go the direction the culture is going. And I, I really think this person, I, I just, this person wasn't talking about power structures um, and, and the, the categories that he's using today. So once you, you conclude, yes, this person has indeed changed, how have they changed and how is that impacting their current definition of the gospel? These are things that, unfortunately, we're all having to deal with. The critical theory is always designed to divide and to deconstruct. That's, what, that's, its, that's its essence. And so it can do that directly. For example, there was an excellent thread on Twitter today that was talking about people who are saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. And it was pointing out, they're not saying that two plus two always equals five. They're saying that two plus two can equal four. It may almost always equal four, but it doesn't always have to equal four. Sometimes in some contexts, it can equal five and it's appropriate to say so. This is called deconstruction. It is meant to diminish your certainty as to the truthfulness of foundational issues. Now, you all, if you're even semi as geeky as I am, you have been fascinated by the SpaceX stuff recently. Fascinated. Uh, they, they splashed down, I think, was that yesterday? Recently, they splashed down uh, from the space station. And the mission went flawlessly and, you know, they landed 
exactly where they were supposed to land. And the thing that just blows me away is they're reusing their booster rockets. And these, these babies turn around and come back and land on a ship in the ocean. <laughs> that is so cool. I mean, that is just awesome. But let me guarantee you something. The engineers that designed that incredible system, they may not live, they may not personally live consistently here, but the engineers that build that system that can make those booster rockets land right back where they're supposed to land know that two plus two equals four. And if they even once put into their calculations that two plus two equals five, the rocket will probably blow up. It could, or it's not going to land. It's going to crash or whatever. Because especially doing stuff like that, when you have to, you know, we just launched another Explorer to Mars. That is so cool. This one's supposed to have all sorts of cool, neat equipment on it. And I hope it works. I think that is great stuff. But the fact is, they assumed all the way through in their calculations of getting that thing built, launched, and to land on that little spinning object hundreds of millions of miles away, that two plus two equals four. And if they put two plus two equals five in even once, it'll miss Mars completely. Total failure. That's not colonization. That's not white fragility. That's not white privilege. That's called mathematics. And God made it that way. Two plus two can equals five. And by the way, if two plus two can equal five, fractals couldn't exist. Well, the beautiful signs of God, God's beautiful fingerprints in mathematics. If two plus two equals five, they're gone. Doesn't work anymore. Nothing works anymore. And so this is what deconstruction is. You're deconstructing people's confidence that fundamental objective foundational truths are just that truths and you're getting them to accept the idea of well okay i suppose you know i, I heard some scholars say that in certain circumstances two plus two might equal five well then you're 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 no longer talking about addition in the context in which we're speaking which is the addition of two plus two it always equals four now, if you want to come up with imaginary numbers, if you want to put it in the event horizon of a black hole or something like that, you're no longer talking about the same thing. You're playing with language. And that's exactly what people, that's exactly what critical theory does as well, is it plays with language. It, it Well, look at what, was it Rutgers that identified proper grammar as racist? And so there's not going to be an emphasis upon matching verbs and things like that. You, you do realize this is dis destroying the very mechanisms by which we communicate truth. And that's its intention. Spiritually, this is rebellion. This is rebellion against God. It's rebellion against the God who made the universe to function in a particular fashion, who made us communicative beings who made us to communicate in such a way that he could communicate his will to us in scripture. All of this, it is, it is rebellion and destruction of these very things. And so this whole uh, area of critical theory and the, the creation of lenses is what we're seeing. And so this article that I was telling you about, it's by Tim Keller, it's filled with the language of critical theory, critical thought of, of wokeness, because this is, this is the context in which uh, Brother Keller finds himself in the New York, Washington, East Coast black hole of... Marxist infiltration, basically. And so I was explaining to a friend, 
who said, you know, I've, I've really benefited from, from Keller in the past, but recently I'm just seeing this more and more. And I, I didn't mention it, but I've mentioned on, on this program, I remember, I think it was 2014, uh, hearing, yeah, I think it was 2014, maybe even been earlier than that now, I think about it. Um, I, I remember hearing Tim Keller on a radio program he was talking about a book he had done on suffering. And as I listened to him speaking about the issue of God's sovereignty and suffering, the only thought that the words that came out of my mouth, I remember I was driving a rental car, as I recall, the words that came out of my mouth was that's not a Westminster man. That's not a man who is, who is bound by a confession any longer. Uh, that's not what Westminster says about the sovereignty of God and the sinfulness of man and the decree of God. And, and you're, you're not, that's just, that's just not what he's saying to this audience. And I wondered at the time why that was. But I, I told my friend, I likened it to, to these glasses that I have. These are, these are riding glasses of mine. Um, and you'll notice they're primarily clear. And so you might say, well, those, why, why would you have clear glasses? Well, obviously when you ride, there's stuff flying around. And, uh, but they're the ones that I wear when I ride at night. And I am more confident. There isn't a whole lot of stuff flying around at night, but you know, once in a while. But I feel more confident, confident with my, my eyes protected. When you're going fast, you want stuff there, dust and things like that. But you might recognize that they're not perfectly clear. They're photochromatic. And so as the sun comes up and as ultraviolet radiation hits that lens, it changes and it begins to darken. And eventually it'd be a fairly, fairly dark pair of sunglasses, which is what you need when you're riding home in the early sunlight. And I likened to the situation with people like Tim Keller and others to a lens. And once you allow an interpretive lens into your teaching and preaching of the word of God. And, and you, may have, you may have the greatest positive intentions in adopting that lens. You really might. You might go, you know, to reach our city, there's just, there's just so much postmodernism in our city. There, there's got to be a better way to communicate to these people and to, and to get more of them to listen to our message. And so you may, you may have the greatest intentions in the world and the initial lens might be very thin and it might only have a small impact upon the amount of light getting through or upon the focus. Cause that's what a lens, a corrective lens. This is not a corrective lens that I have here. Uh, but that's what a corrective lens does. It's slightly, you know, a very weak lens just changes slightly the area of focus in what you're looking at. The problem is once you start, generally you have to keep increasing the strength of the lens. And I hear that, or if you want to use the photochromatic example, as the light gets stronger and stronger, there's, there's more and more resultant darkening that takes place within the photochromatic lens. I think that's the explanation for why we have seen so many who 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were all saying the same thing. They weren't talking like this. They weren't looking at scripture like this. They were not using these categories. They didn't define racism the way they define it today. I mean, there, there, there are literally churches, entire churches. Ed Stetzer this morning. They're going to do a study through D'Angelo's white fragility. And, and I, just, I just look at anyone who can be taken in by D'Angelo. I mean, the money she has made off of that book, off of presenting pure incoherence. utter destruction of logic and rationality argumentation that should not pass a first year level um logic class really shouldn't 
And yet she's made a mint off of it. And I am stunned. I, I understand why corporations are doing it because corporations, it's the bottom line. And if to their woke leadership, this is the best way to keep the bottom line intact, then that's what they're going to do. But churches and denominations, they would promote a book that basically says that Honestly, honestly, you boil it all down. If you breathe and you're white, you're a racist. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you respond to the discussion of quote unquote racism. Any response you give will prove you're a racist. If you respond too quickly, white fragility. If you respond too slowly, white fragility. If you respond with anger, white fragility. If you respond agreeing, white fragility. It doesn't matter what you do. If you blink, if you breathe, it's your mere existence. You are convicted. And that kind of argumentation is vacuous, vapid, childish, and simply stupid. It is. It could be used to prove absolutely positively anything. It cannot be disproven because it actually does not make any meaningful truth claim. And yet, we have entire churches and denominations. They're going, we need to have a conversation about this. The only conversation you have about that is how such a stupid book is selling so well. That's the only conversation that needs to be had. I, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. I truly am. That anyone cannot see through the foolishness of this kind of argumentation. But it's out there. Ed Stetzer is promoting it. Uh, and so my friend noted a couple of points. I, I was just going to look at them. A couple of points in Tim Keller's article. This is a biblical critique of secular justice and critical theory. It's interesting. It's a biblical critique of secular justice and critical theory, which you would think is like, oh, good. He's going to push back. Not really. Not when you've already adopted the categories of the system you're then critiquing. So under section two called equity, everyone must be treated equally and with dignity. I have a quotation Leviticus 24, 22. You are to have the same law for the foreigner as for the native born. The Hebrew term mesraim means equity. And Isaiah 33, 15 says, those who speak with mesraim keep their hands from accepting bribes. Then he says this, bribery is unjust because in commerce, law, and government, it does not treat the poor the same as it does the wealthy. Any system of justice or government in which decisions or outcomes are determined by how much money parties have is a stench before God. Now, it is very true that bribery has been used to undercut justice, but everyone has used bribes. Um, women with no money have used bribes of sexual favors to undercut the justice system. Wealthy people use bribes against with other people. Bribery, to say bribery is unjust because in commerce, law, and government, it does not treat the poor as the same as the wealthy. That's not why it's wrong. It has nothing to do with poor and wealthy. That's not even its category. Its category is the transfer of wealth for the purpose of evading the specifics of God's law. Where does this, where does this even come from? Don't know. In an article where you're pushing, uh, supposed to be pushing back, there's not pushing back. There's acceptance. It's strange. Then later on, there's, there's a lot to be to talk about, but I'm just looking at the sections that, that my friends specifically sent to me and said, am I missing something here? Uh, he says, under the section comparing biblical justice to the alternatives, section C, finally, the storyline of the whole Bible is God's repeated identification with the wretched, powerless, and marginalized. The central story of the Old Testament is liberation of slaves from captivity. Over and over in the Bible, God's deliverers are usually racial and social outsiders. People seem to be weak and reject in the eyes of the power leads to the world. That has nothing to do with the Bible at all. I, I read that and I go, this is supposed to be a pushback. This isn't pushback. This is a Trojan horse insertion. 
of the very thing that the title makes us think it's a pushback against. I mean, let's look at this again. The storyline of the whole Bible. What is the storyline of the whole Bible? The storyline of the whole Bible is the glorification of the triune God through the redemption of a people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, not based upon anything in them, not based upon their social status, their money, their power structures, or anything else, but solely to the praise of his glorious grace in and through Jesus Christ and him alone. That's the story of the Bible. Old and New Testament. How does that, by someone who claims to follow the Westminster standards, how does that become the storyline of the whole Bible is God's repeated identification with the wretched, powerless, and marginalized? Like David? Solomon? Was he identifying with the powerful there? He made them kings, right? He gave them all their power, right? Does... Is there a biblical teaching that God demands justice for the widow and the orphan who would be those who are wretched, powerless, marginalized? Is there, uh, is there justice in scripture uh, for individuals who are poor? So you're, you're not to glean all the way to the corners of your field. And so you're to provide, that was sort of in an agricultural setting the uh, provision of assistance for those who are marginalized. Okay, that's definitely there. Is that the storyline? That's the, the primary thing? Wow, there's a lot of excess words in there if that's the primary thing, because it's certainly the fact that the people of Israel ignored it, the, people, the, fact, the fact the people of Israel did uh, rebellion against it, Sure, but that's not the storyline. It's God's dealing with a hard-hearted and rebellious people despite his constant blessings. The central story of the Old Testament is liberation of slaves from captivity. Really? Again, everybody knows, well, there were slaves who were liberated from captivity in the Old Testament. See, there's an element of truth to it. I guess you forgot God was the one who sent them into that slavery initially and then sent them into slavery again and again and again. We forgot that part. I'm just, I'm, I'm just left going. The, the lens has become really thick when you can start saying this. Over and over in the Bible, God's deliverers are usually racial and social outsiders. Really? So Isaiah was a racial and social outsider? Or are we not talking about the prophet? What is this even talking about? People seem to be weak and rejected in the eyes of the power leads the world. The power leads the world. Was he talking like this 15 years ago? He may have been one of the first ones. He may have been one of the first ones. But this is not what we were hearing. And now, even when pushing back, the collapse is right there. The compromise is right there. It's just, it's just part of the language. It is truly amazing. Now, it becomes really troubling, really troubling when it starts impacting your doctrine of Jesus. Remember a few years ago uh, when Keller tweeted um, that basically the incarnation was God wanting to get close to you. All I could hear was the carpenters close to you. What? What? And my, my pushback, my response to him was no, the incarnation was about the triune God Father, Son, Holy Spirit, choosing to redeem a particular people powerfully by grace through the incarnation of the Son of God and his self-offering upon the cross of Calvary, all to the praise and glory of himself. Um, it has nothing to do with getting close to you. That was where I really started getting the idea that there was some pretty major problems 
uh, going on in, in Brother Keller's departure from where he had once been in time past. So we get this, and this is toward the end of the article. When God came to earth in Jesus Christ, he came as a poor man to a family at the bottom of the social order. Um, no, carpenters would be what we would call middle class, actually. Sorry, it's just true. Um, they were skilled laborers, and there was a real um, demand for their, their skill. So as much as you want to say, well, he must have been poor because they had to go to the manger. That's because they were traveling. They were traveling someplace where you wouldn't have family. So, no, sorry. Uh, but you notice, poor man. Uh, bottom of the social order. So we've got to make everything about man, power structures, economics. That's what woke religion does. He experienced torture and death at the hands of religious and government elites using their power unjustly to oppress. Yes, according to Acts chapter 4, verses 27 to 28, those individuals did exactly what God's hand predestined to occur. Got to have that part in there. Doesn't really fit with the woke stuff, but uh, but I, I don't remember. the. I, I mean, we have principalities and powers in the New Testament. That's definitely referred to. But we understand what government elites um, and so on and so forth. So in Jesus, we see God laying aside his privilege and power. M dash, his quote, glory, end quote, M dash. So now the, the glory of the pre incarnate son is being placed in the categories of critical theory privilege and power. I thought privilege was always bad. Isn't privilege always bad? Privilege and power. God lays aside his privilege and power, because see, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to lay aside our, quote, privilege and our power in the service for others. Well, Philippians chapter 2 actually gives us the proper context, and that's the text he's going to go to. That's, that's what caught my attention, because he says, in order to identify with the weak and helpless, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Excuse me, excuse me. You will not find weak and helpless anywhere in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. What you will find is the son taking on human nature. And by the way, God in his grace has saved powerful men, rich men. Believe it or not, God has even saved a few. Ever says that that decision is based upon ethnicity or race. Men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. But may I remind you, if you're going to take the Bible seriously, there were many centuries that passed where God's blessings were given to one people and not given to others. Was that wrong? Consistently, be consistent in your argumentation. Was it wrong for centuries to pass as God sent prophets to deal with a small nation on the Mediterranean and nobody else? Nobody else. Nowhere in the Carmen Christian, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, are we told that he laid aside his glory in order to identify with the weak and helpless. He took on a perfect human nature so that he might die upon the cross. And when you replace dying upon the cross of Calvary with some kind of social justice theory, you are this close to walking right out of the faith. Right out of the faith. Somebody needs to get Tim Keller's ear. He's not going to listen to me. I'm not one of the, the big Eva schmoozers. But somebody needs to get his ear and say, brother, you've missed it. You have missed it. And yet, through the endurance of violence and human injustice, see the categories? 
enduring violence and human injustice, rather than what Philippians actually says, that he emptied himself. He made himself no reputation, and he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, and that was not obedience to categories of violence and human injustice. God used violence and human injustice, but to make them the primary category is to miss the whole point of the submission of the son to the father in the perfect provision of salvation itself. <sighs> Through the endurance of violence and human injustice, he paid the rightful penalty of humanity's sin to divine justice, Isaiah 53, 5. That's right. That's the only kind of justice there really is. And there is a huge difference, a huge difference between the divine justice of Isaiah 53 and the man-centered justice of equity equaling equality and everything else that is now being presented in our society. Then he was raised to even greater honor and also to authority to rule. Well, why, how, why would that? Why not equity? This doesn't sound very woke. There should be equity. But he gets something other than that. He gets privilege back. Hmm. Jesus takes authority, but only after losing it in service to the weak and helpless. No, after laying aside the equality he had with the Father so that he might redeem God's elect. Are they weak and helpless? You better believe they are. All mankind is weak and helpless. By grace, he chooses a particular people and brings about their salvation. For what purpose? To the glory of the triune God. It's all to the glory of the triune God. And I'm sorry, but the idea of the glorification of the triune God is not a woke concept. That's not going to fit. That ain't going to fly at a BLM protest. That's not going to fly. So how do you get to stuff like this? Well, it's a slow process. Well, slow. I'm not sure we would necessarily call it slow, but it's not slow anymore. Okay. Now, um, Next, I would like to switch over, get myself a little, little drink here. Ah, man, that's good stuff. Apple cider vinegar. Whoo. Oh, no, it's cut. I'm not, you can't do that straight. Are you kidding? Uh, but in Arizona, where we've been setting and breaking records, we tied record yesterday at 114. July was the hottest record, hottest month on record in Phoenix. And they, um, they calculated that not on the basis of the high temperatures like that, but the average of the high and the low. And three times in the past, we had had a July, I think two Julys and one August, where the average temperature, so the average between the high and the low was 98.3 degrees. By the way, that's, that's how warm your pool water will be uh, by August is the average of the high and the low. So it's like taking a bath. That's why I don't have a pool anymore. But I um, haven't had for quite some time. Three times we had had 98.3. You know what the average temperature was in July in Phoenix? Just passed, 99. Seven tenths of a degree. Blew the record away. Average temperature between morning and night for 31 days, 99 degrees. <laughs> that was toasty. And it's staying that way. So I would like to do some story time with Uncle Jimmy. Yes, story time with Uncle Jimmy. I want to read some material to you. Don't tune out on me, please. I am hoping this will be useful to you. I want you to think back, if you were with us on the last program, I quoted from a great bishop who lived at the end of the fifth century, deeply influenced by Augustine, 
by the name of Fulgentius. Fulgentia, Fulgentius of Rusp. And you can get, you know, we don't have a lot of his works, but thankfully we have enough that you can get a really good sense of where he's coming from. And um, he wrote some correspondence on Christology and grace to the Scythian monks. Now, let's remember our church history. Always important to remember our church history. You don't want to pop quiz and not remember your church history. Um, Council of Chalcedon is right in the middle of the fifth century. So Fulgentius is living within the lived memory of those who were at Chalcedon. And, and what, what do you have at Chalcedon? You have the definition of what we would call today the, the conclusion of the Christological controversies, the definition of the hypostatic union, and specifically that Jesus is one person with two natures. This was over against Nestorianism, Eutychianism, Apollinarianism, all of which in some way, shape, or form uh, obliterated the clarity of the humanity, deity, and obscure the relationship between the two in the person of Jesus. And so you get the Chalcedonian definition. And there are still people in the East who do not accept the Chalcedonian definition. Um, but that is the big subject of the day. It, there, there's, there's nobody who's woke. Um, there's nobody uh, who's talking dispensational premillennialism hasn't developed yet, won't develop for another 1,300 years um, in that form. Um, there's, the, there's no Left Behind series. <laughs> um, none of that stuff. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're talking theology, you're talking about the person of Christ. And so what's interesting is the real discussions that would be going on in the marketplace would be about subjects that, to be honest with you, most evangelical Christians today would not be able to engage the subject whatsoever. Hypostatic union? Honestly, what percentage of professing Christians in the United States today would be able to pass a basic level quiz in defining the hypostatic union correctly? I will let you sadly reflect upon <laughs> the reality of that. But in writing to these monks, uh, Fulgentius, well, just comes up with some incredible material. And I quoted from him um, in the last program. I want to give more of the context because uh, I, I just find Fulgentius to be a I think, as I said then, a, a, a breath of fresh air in um, reading in the, early, in the early church. So looking at his first letter to the Scythian monks, section three, just enjoy. There's really not going to be much to be looking at here. I'm not displaying it. Um, it's, I, it's in my logos, and so it's just text. Um, but hopefully you'll find this to be Useful. I realize that some people, I, I'm sorry, I'm re listening to what the early church father said. He's not really early church either. This is getting very close to the medieval period, late, late early church period, early medieval period, depending on where you draw that particular line. Therefore, if anyone refuses or hesitates to believe and preach, either that there are two natures or that there is one person in our Lord Jesus Christ, or if anyone refuses to confess that the same one, that is the word incarnate, was truly born of the Virgin Mary for our salvation, is God and man, the Catholic faith recognizes and shows such a one to be as much a stranger as he is an ingrate who opposes the mystery of human redemption. For this is that great mystery of godliness recommended to all the faithful by the mouth of the apostle. The mystery that was made manifest in the flesh was justified in the spirit, appeared to angels, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on this world, was taken up in glory. This is, of course, the word who was in the beginning and was with God and was God. That is the only begotten son of God and the power and wisdom of God through whom and in whom all things were made and without whom nothing was made. 
This same is the only begotten God, although he existed in the form of God. I stop for just a moment. Do you notice? Uh, this same is the only begotten God. That's the what we would in older language call the Alexandrian reading of John 1.18. Uh, the textual variant of John 1.18, monogonese theos, only begotten God, unique God, versus monogonese huios, the only begotten Son. Uh, he is familiar with and utilizes the critical text reading of John 1.18. I continue. That is, he was equal in all things, the one who begat him. He possessed a unity of natural essence with him, and he was in that nature which he, being eternal, has from the Father, that which the Father naturally is. The same one was true God, most high and immutable. He was not a different God from the Father, but instead, although the personal distiller, nor of a different power, nor of another essence. I stop just to comment. That's basically an expanded definition of homoousios from the Council of Nicaea. This same one, although he exists in the form of God, nevertheless, he did not regard being equal with God as something to be forcibly kept. I stop again. That's my interpretation of Harpagmon in the Karma Christi, Philippians chapter 2. Great to see someone 1,400 years ago, uh, 1,500 years ago, uh, reading it in the same way, understanding it in the same way. It's one of the one wonderful things about reading Athanasius or Fulgentius or, or some of these individuals. Um, with God as something to be forcibly kept, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. I stop again. By taking. That's exactly, if you read my article, and I had not run into Fulgentius when I wrote my article for CRI, the CRI Journal, 15 years ago, 17 years ago. I'm not sure how long ago it was now. I'm not even sure if it was, may have been the late 90s. Now I think about it, so it may have been over 20 years ago. I don't know. But by taking the form, that's exactly, I think, the key element of that text. The same one was made in the likeness of men. The same one was found to be in the human condition. In him, there could be no thought of forcibly keeping because the begotten fullness of natural equality remains in him since he is from the Father's substance by an ineffable and eternal birth. Therefore, he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. Thus, indeed, God willed to be man naturally. And so the Lord of all things took on a servile nature without loss of his own sovereignty. Again, exactly true. I'm to say amen. Correspondingly, having emptied himself, he compassionately accepted the form of a slave. The holy apostle of the new covenant, after being made a fit minister by God, just as he himself bears witness, also himself testifies about this form, lest any one of us who hears about the emptied Son of God should by evil thought imagine that the form in the only begotten God has lost or diminished its equality with the Father's form, and lest such a person, by following the crooked, circuitous ways of the serpent's deception, should not hold the path of right faith. To prevent this from happening, Paul clarified that emptying by removing the unclear elements when he added subsequently by taking the form of a slave. This is, sorry, but if you've, again, if you've read my article on this, this was, this was one of the biggest elements that I was emphasizing. Um, and it was before I ran into Fulgentius. So it is always thrilling because I was simply exegeting the text. I was seeking to be consistent with what it's saying and communicating within the parameters of the sermon illustration that it is and the, the primitive hymn in the early church. And so here you have Fulgentius saying the exact same thing um, long, before, long before I did, that's for sure. Therefore, the only begotten God's emptying was his taking the form of a slave since there was no loss or diminishment of his divinity. The divine nature, to be sure, cannot be diminished or increased in any way because it is immutable and remains always what it is. For if that true and most high God, who for our sakes became poor, although he was rich, so that he might become rich, we might become rich through his poverty, had been emptied in the sense of losing his fullness, even saying this is wicked, or had undergone some change when he accepted the form of a slave, then blessed John the evangelist would not have said about the incarnate word, and we have seen his glory, the glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word who was made flesh began to be human flesh in human reality, but in divine reality, he did not cease to be the word. For this reason, the wonderful kindness of God, the Redeemer, effectually accomplished the mystery of taking up and redeeming man because the divine majesty could never admit of any change or diminishment. This is extremely important. I can't tell you how many times in, in 
classes on Christology, systematic theology. This has been one of the major questions students have had about the subject of the incarnation and excellent answers being given from the text of scripture by a bishop uh, at the beginning of the sixth century. Therefore, the word of God, the very same God, the word, when he took human flesh from the flesh of his mother, did indeed receive the form of a slave in such a way that he deigned to become what he in fact became. But he did this while remaining in the form of God, that is eternal and immutable God, through that unity of person which he received the form of a slave. Indeed, when he was made in the likeness of men, he was found to be in human condition. Although in all ways he had immutable deity from the nature of the Father, nevertheless, he who was not created deigned to be created, and he who was not created but begotten from the Father willed to be born from a woman. In this manner, the word was made flesh, so that there might be one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who is God over all things and is blessed into the ages. Romans 9, 5, again, interpreted correctly by Fulgentius. He is the one true son of God and son of man, one and the same from the father without beginning, always having been the begotten God, but indeed also truly God according to the flesh, conceived and born in time from his mother. It was not that the only begotten God received an unconceived flesh, but rather God himself was conceived in that flesh in the profoundest humility. Indeed, according to the flesh, God himself was created in and from the virgin. And in fact, he who had created his own mother was created from and in that flesh, the mystery of the incarnation. If, however, God the word had become flesh and the virgin in such a way that he had not come from her, it is certain that God himself would not have possessed the substance of flesh from the flesh of his mother, but would have simply have passed through the virgin. Think about that for a second, just pass through the virgin. In such a case, he could not have accomplished the mystery of becoming the mediator for our salvation, which is what I said on the last program about what happens if you accept the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Because in that case, Christ, the Son of God, would not have, would not have confusedly united true, full humanity and divine substance in himself. Therefore, the medical remedy, as it were, the divine goodness employed was that the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the father should become man, not only in a woman, but also from that woman. Without doubt, we are commanded by the prophets of God to believe and confess this. Indeed, the prophet did not keep silent about the fact that God was made man when he said, Mother Zion will say a man, truly a man was born in her and the most high himself has established her. Isaiah also filled by the Holy Spirit foretold the mystery of the coming incarnation of the son of God. Thus, behold, a virgin will conceive in her womb, will bear a son. His name will be called Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Therefore, because the one whom the virgin conceived in her womb and bore is called God with us, we recognize that indeed God has been conceived in the virgin's womb and has been born. The gospel also says of Mary, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph too, Mary's husband, with whom she did not have sexual relations and experienced corruption of the flesh, but who was the witness to the witness to and guardian of her sacred virginity and purest fruitfulness is thus advised by the angel's oracle joseph son of david do not be afraid to take mary as your wife for what has been born in her is of the holy spirit it is also shown by heaven sent words that he that one born in her was made from her for the apostle said but when the fullness of time came god sent his own son made from a woman made under the law likewise as he was writing to the romans he established this excellent beginning of his letter in order to show that he set a true and stable foundation of faith. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he had promised through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was made from the seed of David according to the flesh. Also in writing to Timothy, his beloved son, the flesh, he chiefly urges him with anxious affection to remember his faith, saying, remember that Christ Jesus, who was from the seed of David, arose from the dead according to my gospel. Also, the angel Gabriel is found to have used this consolation when speaking of the Blessed Virgin herself, namely, the future bearer of her creator, indeed, of the creator of all things. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore that holy thing that will be born from you will be called the Son of God. I stopped just long enough not only to take a drink, but also to point out, what's he doing? Is he giving us tradition? Is he saying, we're to believe this because this person, he's giving us scripture. 
What's he basing his presentation on? Scripture. That's what Augustine did, and that's what um, Fulgentius is doing. To this belongs the mystery of our salvation, because our father Abraham ordered the steward of his household to place his hand under his loins and swear by the God of heaven. One should not suppose that he did this apart from the prophetic spirit, that is to say, at the time when the chosen vessel hinted that all things happened as figures. Therefore, holy Abraham, the father of the nations, did not do this because he believed that there was already some natural union with the God of heaven in his flesh. Instead, he did this so that we, he might show that the God of heaven was going to be born as a man from that flesh, which would bring the truth from among the descendants of Abraham himself. Therefore, that truth is the one Christ, the Son of God, in the natures of divinity and flesh. In him, the oneness of person does not confuse the human and divine natures, hypostatic union, and the unconfused oneness of the nature does not make them exist as two persons. Consequently, the truth of our reconciliation and salvation remains because God, the only begotten, became true man for us, and the man who was conceived and born was none other than the only begotten God. The importance of the fact of the incarnation. Therefore, the blessed Mary both conceived and bore God the word inasmuch as he was made flesh. God the word did not insert the flesh in which he was conceived into her womb. Nor did God himself, who was to be conceived, take on the material of conceived or formed flesh apart from her. Instead, he assumed that flesh from her as he was being born. He received the nature of human flesh from and in the virgin herself, and the eternal God was temporally conceived and born according to that nature. To be sure, the virginal conception was the very act of accepting flesh, because apart from temporal flesh, that spiritual nature of the word of God that was begotten without beginning from God the Father could not have been conceived in the womb of that saint, who was herself both mother and spiritual virgin. Likewise, apart from union with the word of God, flesh could in no way be engendered in the inmost virginal womb that had not been inseminated by intercourse with a man. Therefore, when God was to be conceived in her, therefore, when God, who was to be conceived in her, arrived at that very time, the nature of the virgin who conceived offered this flesh from itself. Thus, one must not imagine that there was any interval of time between the origin of the conceived flesh and the arrival of the majesty who was to be conceived. Indeed, there is one conception of divinity and flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and there is one Christ, the Son of God, conceived in both natures, so that thereafter he might begin to erase the stain of the corruption, corrupted offspring, which was seen to exist in each person who was born. Now, why the emphasis upon that, if you're familiar with the Christological controversies of that time period, that was an anti-Nestorian polemic. That was, that was an affirmation of the hypostatic union over against at least what is attributed to Nestorius, who would not use the term Theotokos, but preferred Christotokos. Section eight, we're gonna read through section 13. This is a fairly lengthy section, but I wanted you to get a true flavor for what Fulgentius is talking about and how he is addressing it. For because all men are born of intercourse between male and female, then because of their very conception, they have the beginning of original sin spread upon them by that contact. For that sin, which is the first man incurred when he was led astray by the devil's malice, even though he was good by nature, passed into his descendants along with its punishment, that is death, a fact that holy David truly declared saying, behold, I was conceived in iniquities and in sins my mother bore me. Thus, as the merciful and just Lord sought to destroy the vestiges of human iniquity, it was absolutely necessary that the Immaculate One deigned to unite an immaculate human nature to himself. By the way, the Immaculate One there is not Mary. The Immaculate One deigned to unite an immaculate human nature to himself is about Jesus. In the very act of conception, an act which ordinarily the devil was accustomed to rule as his own portion and dominion by inflicting the stain of original sin. Therefore, the only begotten God accepted the conception and birth of his human nature, a nature that he willed to assume truly and completely. May it never be that any Catholic would believe or say it, the only begotten God, who was to redeem us by his own blood, 
in that flesh by which God himself was made man might reject the beginnings of human conception when in fact God was going to suffer the extremes of human mortality in that same flesh while remaining immortal himself. For just as the true and living God did not lose his unchangeable and indestructible natural condition as he died in the flesh, so also the same God who was naturally infinite and eternal did not lack his natural infiniteness when he was conceived in circumscribed flesh. And when he was born in the flesh temporally, he did not lose his natural eternality in which he was the eternal God from the Father and in the Father. For by that life he wanted his death to be the death he assumed in the flesh, and that eternality had its temporal conception in his mother. Therefore, this is deep stuff. It's great. Therefore, God the Word, that is the only begotten Son of God, who is in all things, just as he himself bears witness, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, thus did not initially refuse to be conceived in flesh according to human nature, just as God, by dying in the same flesh, later paid the debt of human nature. For human nature would have been in no way sufficient and satisfactory for removing the sin of the world unless it had passed into the oneness of God, the word, not by a confusion of the natures, but only by a unity of person. Again, over against Eutychianism or Apollinarianism in various forms. To be sure, when the word became flesh by a wondrous union, he created his nature and he re that he received from us. Nonetheless, in that divine and profoundly wondrous union, the divinity of the word was not changed into flesh and the true humanity of the word absolutely preserved the natural reality of our race. Therefore, a virgin, and one must constantly call to mind the fact that she was a virgin, both conceived and gave birth to God the word himself according to the flesh that was made in her. The one she bore was the only begotten God, the very power and wisdom of God, the radiance of eternal light and the flawless mirror of God's majesty, the image of his goodness, the splendor of his glory, and the figure of his substance. The one she bore was the one whom the unchangeable and eternal divinity of the Father begat as the eternal and unchangeable one without any beginning of his nature. The virginal womb first conceived and gave birth to this same one, God and man, complete and entire in human nature. This, I hope you see, is a very full-throated defense of the Chalcedonian formula. When, however, we say the Lord Christ is God and man, we point not to a duality of persons, but to the fact that a very true union of both natures has taken place at any mingling, i.e. the hypostatic union. To be sure, the same God who is man is the same man who is God. For human nature was wondrously united to God, the word, in such a way that the true God himself would become true man. And indeed, in such a way, the true humanity, the incarnate word, would possess no other person than the incarnate word. For it was a human substance, not a person that was added to God. Therefore, God with his own flesh is one Christ, the son of God and the son of man, the same one at the same time, both word and flesh. Indeed, the same word is flesh, for the same God is man. But God the word did not receive flesh in some way without becoming flesh, since the evangelist says the word was made flesh. And the most high and most great God did not assume the nature of flesh in the way he dwelt in one of the patriarchs or prophets. In that case, God would certainly have been in that man, but God himself would not have been a man. May it never happen that the Christian conscience, conscience holds to such understanding or that anyone among the faithful permits himself to be defiled by such great ungodliness. For when the word was made flesh, divinity thus deigned to unite humanity miraculously to, himself, to itself in such a way that for the life of the world, that humanity of his would come into being as divine humanity in one and the same God and man, Christ, while preserving the reality of both natures. For God, not withholding his mercies and his anger, was made man for this purpose, that whatever he had created whole in man, God might make it completely whole again once he had taken it into himself. As a result, we're getting close to the end here. As a result, he possessed this marvelous quality of being both God and man, because he was truly conceived and born according to the flesh. Consequently, the virgin ineffably conceived and bore the God of heaven, and the virgin mother remained inviolate. After all, an angel has truthfully proclaimed that she was full of grace and blessed amongst women. Luke chapter 1. Now remember, stopping for a moment, in modern Roman Catholic theology, this has now been extended beyond the birth of Christ. And so what happens is modern Roman Catholic apologists will take that later 
concept and read it back and insist, well, see, here's, here's the same thing we're saying at a, at a later period. As we're going to see in a moment, that don't work. By the power and work of prevenient grace, the Holy Spirit came over her and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. And she was, as she was about to conceive the one who was God and the Son of God, she neither desired nor engaged in intercourse, but instead, while maintaining her virginity in both mind and body, she received from him what she was about to conceive and give birth to by a gift of uncorrupted fertility and fertile purity. Thus did the Holy Virgin conceive God the Word as he, the creator of angels and men, was himself made according to the flesh. And the same way she gave birth to the Redeemer of men. For the Holy Virgin Mary did not conceive God without assuming his flesh or conceive flesh without its union with God because the one whom the Virgin conceived belonged jointly to the, to the God of the Virgin and to the flesh of the Virgin. This is the grace by which, this is section 13, this is a section from which I quoted uh, yesterday. This is the grace by which it came about that God who came to take away sins because there is no sin in him, was conceived from sinful flesh and born as man in the likeness of sinful flesh. To be sure, the flesh of Mary had been conceived in iniquity in accordance with human practice. And so her flesh that gave birth to the Son of God in the likeness of sinful flesh was indeed sinful. This is an accurate translation. I have the Patrologia Latine uh, citation. If someone questions that, it's an accurate translation. Fulgentius said, to be sure, the flesh of Mary had been conceived in iniquity in accordance with human practice, and so her flesh that gave birth to the Son of God in the likeness of sinful flesh was indeed sinful. The apostle bear witness, bears witness that God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That is to say, he sent the one who, although he existed in the form of God, nevertheless did not regard being equal with God as something to be forcibly kept, but emptying himself by taking the form of a slave, he was made in the likeness of men. For that reason, the Son of God, the same one who was made in the likeness of men, was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he might become like men in the true flesh that he himself had created, and so that God, created in the flesh without sin, might remove our dissimilarity to himself. He understood this dissimilarity in our flesh to be a result of his work, not of his work, but of our sin. Therefore, as the Son of God appeared, he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh because human mortality was present in his true human flesh, but not human iniquity. When it is said that truly the likeness of sinful flesh is in the Son of God, or rather that the Son of God is in the likeness of sinful flesh, one must believe that the only begotten God did not take the defilement of sin from the mortal flesh of the virgin, but that he received the full reality of its nature so that the source of truth might rise from the earth, the source whom the blessed David announces in a prophetic word saying, truth has sprung out of the earth. Consequently, Mary, whom God accepted, truly conceived and bore the word incarnate. Section 14, be the last one that I read. But she gained the privilege of conceiving and bearing God-made man, not because of human merits, but because of the condescension of the most high God who was being conceived and born from her. For if God the word had not been born as a true and full human being by uniting human nature taken from the virgin to himself in an exceptional way, he could never have been the source of spiritual birth from God for us who had been born carnally. But in order that the divine birth might be given to those who had been carnally born, the divine majesty was first conceived and born in the true flesh of the only begotten son. For salvation was far from sinners and our iniquities separate us greatly from God because we were held, held bound by the fetters of death from the very moment of our fleshly birth. And because we could be set free from this death only by the blessing of spiritual birth, God was born of a man so that men might be born of God. For this reason, therefore, Christ, the Son of God, that is, the true God in eternal life, was born and died in true flesh so that we might be reborn spiritually in the one name of the Trinity through the sacrament of baptism. The apostle teaches this, saying, we who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. 
So he goes on from there, but you might say, man, that was a long reading. Well, I think some of those Gnostic gospels we read were longer than that. But the point is, compare so often because so many of us, so few of us read from the early church. We assume things about the early church that are simply not true. It is not that all patristic materials are equal. Fulgentius is a bright light. But it should be a tremendously challenging thing for us. And for me, it's a, a tremendously encouraging thing to read this kind of clear thinking from so long ago. I have to go compare this with most of what we see going on today. Compare this with much of what is written today. We think ourselves so advanced, but the reality is, when was the last time you sat still and listened to a lengthy discussion of the necessary elements of incarnational theology. Now, obviously, the focus of Fulgentius is on Christ. But I simply have to ask the obvious question. If Fulgentius had believed what modern Roman Catholicism defines to be true, would he have spoken like this? Would he have even had to raise some of the questions about, I mean, he's literally discussing how was it that being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, he does not inherit corruption from Mary's flesh that was born as sinful flesh. It's the exact language he uses. He doesn't say, well, because of the Immaculate Conception, of course. Because at this point in time, that hadn't been thought of. It just hadn't been thought of. It's going to, as it's dogmatically believed today, uh, there's another 600 years or more before you're going to run into a British monk named Edmer. And there's a lot of development in Mariolatry that's going to have to take place before you have that. So there you have uh, Fulgentius of Rusp. I hope that you found, I know, I know, I know, there's probably not too many other people reading Fulgentius of Rusp on their webcast today, but that's fascinating material. It is really important. It's fundamental in giving answers to so many different groups. I mean, this comes up with Mormonism. This comes up with Jehovah's Witnesses, Unitarians. It's important stuff. And it's also important in recognizing that the great Ludwigat was right. They didn't teach this. Uh, the great fathers in the West and East did not teach this. This is something that developed at a later point in time. And real Roman Catholic scholars recognize that. They, they see that that's the case, despite the dogmatic statements of the church that this has been the constant faith from the beginning. That's it's fantasy. It's wishful thinking. It's just not true. It's dogmatic untruth. <laughs> that's 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 what that's what it is dogmatic untruth all right so there you go we uh covered two primary topics today um and they were interesting not the kind of thing that makes people go rah rah i'm so excited as i leave this but hopefully make you thoughtful hopefully um will make you to pray for the church today uh, to pray for Brother Keller. What he said is deeply concerning. Um, I am not amongst those ready to uh, kick him out of the kingdom, but I very plainly are amongst those saying, this is wrong. You are literally twisting the scriptures in Philippians chapter two to create room 
for a narrative that is sub-biblical at best, anti-biblical in reality. And he's not going to receive that from me, but I hope he'll receive it from others. It would be very useful for him to uh, repudiate the things that he's saying now. Maybe others who are also promoting this stuff would repudiate it as well. So thanks for listening to the program today. Thank you to uh, Rich Pierce for putting this together. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I would imagine that Rich probably didn't, wasn't able to listen to, to most of this stuff because what, what you don't know is that Rich is very busy. Rich makes the, the, the greatest buttered croissants in the world because he's French. And so he, he just has so many people writing to him asking for his buttered croissant recipe that he's probably just, he's probably just very busy because he even handwrites, he even handwrites it to people. I think that is just so special. I really think it's special. <laughs> uh, so I, I think he'd love it if, if he had 20 different people writing to him for his buttered croissant recipe <laughs> after this. <laughs> it, it, it's the only 20 people who made it through all that re reading of Fulgentius and Rose <laughs> I don't know where that voice came from. I, did, did you hear a voice? I didn't hear a voice. I, I... <laughs> coming from somewhere else. Anyways, thanks for watching the program today. I'm not sure when we'll be back again. Maybe tomorrow, might be the next day. We'll see. We'll let you know. Thanks for watching. Bye.